Hey folks, Steve here with a special video for you today. This is the first video uh, I'm really doing in earnest covering the great campaigns of the American Civil War series. Uh, we are going to be starting with Stonewall Jackson's Way 2 Battles of Bull Run um, because chronologically, um, the earliest scenario in the whole of the GCACW ecosystem, as far as I'm aware, uh, is the Across the Potomac scenario, which is what I actually have set up here off to the left for a second. I do want to talk about this game very quickly. Um, I had managed to get uh, a copy of this, and it shipped all the way from Australia originally, and and <laughs> it, it was quite a, a ordeal waiting for it to get through custom, customs and, get, and just getting here, period. So that was pretty cool. Um, and it and it took me a long time to actually get this on the table because I was finishing up other games. Um, I was punching and rounding some of the corners in this package for SJW2. Um, and then a lot of other things were going on this past summer that kept me from, from really launching uh, head first into this. So I apologize for a bit of a delay there. Um, but my intent here in the short term is to uh, dive into the all green alike module within this game and uh, basically play this first scenario because it is the the earliest scenario in the whole shebang across all the games in uh, the great campaigns of the american civil war and uh, when i'm done with this because this is really you know some practice i'll probably do a couple other small scenarios uh, and then I do plan on doing uh, the Virginia campaign uh, because I do own a copy of Roads to Gettysburg, uh, which came from the same uh, person who sold me uh, Stonewall Jackson's Way 2, which I'm eternally grateful for. Um, I, I have the map, you know, the maps available to construct whatever scenario makes sense to me. Um, and I can actually play the combined sort of Virginia campaign that is 14 turns long. Uh, that doesn't seem overly long to me, so I, I think it's certainly worthwhile to try to hit in the short term. So several scenarios here uh, that will play from all green alike, and then you know I may take a break from GCACW for a little while, play some other stuff, and come back and play sort of the next chronological campaign um, across the, the game system. So... That's the idea, anyway. We'll, we'll see where we get. Um, certainly think there's a lot of game here to play, period, and uh, we'll, we'll hit it. I do want to call out that um, these couple of videos, or these several videos that I'm going to do on Stonewall Jackson's Way to All Green Alike, um, is not intended to be tutorial videos. So for those who see this and and expect me to do a, a full breakdown of all the rules and in diligent detail. Um, there are other videos out there that kind of cover that. Um, and I don't think I'm going to be able to do a much better job than that. I think I could do maybe as good <clears throat> or worse just because I'm not an expert at the system. I'm still pretty new to it. Um, so, so please don't watch this with the expectation that um, I'm going to be able to teach you the rules. I will talk through the rules as I'm playing, so it will at least make sense in context. So you may be able to glean certain things from watching this demonstration of play, or, or you know, as I go through things to the, the degree that I do, and maybe the rules will be easier for you to understand because of that. Um, but, but there's going to be no sense in me trying to describe uh, a grand assault, for instance, if I'm not doing one and, and, I'm, and I'm not going to craft that situation distinctly just to show it, right? That that's not what I'm going to be doing here. <clears throat> so, um, all that said, uh, I'm going to shift the camera over and show kind of where we're at. It's going to be hard to get everything exactly on camera uh, due to the, the map scale and the blaring awful glare that's on my plexiglass. Um, so I can try to account for that as best that I can. Um, but you can see I'm, I'm actually using the Here Come the Rebels map. Uh, this is from, uh, I believe, Roads to Gettysburg. Um, I think I took it out of that box, I'm quite certain. And uh, because this happens sort of further off to the west than uh, some of the other events in uh, Stonewall Jackson's Way. So uh, you, it's, it's this funny thing with some MMP games, you know, and in and, and this series, like, it, it pays to have 
games in the series, like all the games in the series, basically, um, so that you can do these different things that kind of integrate together um, the scenario. Uh, you know, if you didn't have uh, Roads to Gettysburg, you, you couldn't play the scenario, basically. You'd, you'd have to play one of the other ones, which is just fine, but, um, you know, it is nice to be able to say, yeah, I can, I can play just about anything that I need to. Um, the, the challenge with MMP games being, you know, once they're out, uh, if you don't get them when they're new, then you're going to get them on the secondhand market, and that can be kind of expensive. So um, for those who are watching this and are beginning to be interested in the series and you've not already encountered it somehow, um, it's, it's a very well-regarded series, uh, and it is hard to get a hold of copies sometimes, and they tend to be uh, expensive. Um, so watch out for that. Uh, it's certainly going to be more games in the series, so you, know, you don't want to sleep on those. You certainly would want to get them while you can. That goes for just about any MMP game, in my mind. Um, every MMP game, once it becomes out of print, and then they don't do huge, huge you know, printings of games, um, you're, you're really going to have to be digging into the secondary market to, to get a copy. So keep that in mind. Um, so what, what is the deal with this scenario? Well, it's in the all-green-alike um module we should first talk about what that is so this was something added in stonewall jackson's way 2 uh, when stonewall jackson's way was republished by mmp and it, it is representing um you know first bull run uh the very early early campaign uh near the start of the war uh, or you know some months after the war has really gotten rolling in earnest and these are like the first real major clashes, um, you know, not counting, uh, depending on how you want to count for something. So, um, there are special rules and, and this is the one thing that I'm, I'm still adapting to with the GCACW system is not just the basic rules, which I, I know people laud the rules as being well-written. I, I think they're finely written. Um, but, but gosh, I, I could really be critical of the way that some, some of the verbiage is, is phrased. Um, or, or just like the complexity that the game has in interpreting like what's a dam versus not a dam versus a ford and this thing called a dam on the map is actually not a dam it's a ferry you know that kind of thing <clears throat> that that makes it hard to parse um, if you're not looking at the map the entire time you're doing that so the rules themselves not not too too bad the, the general operations and things that you're doing as the player are actually pretty straightforward which is good it's just in the details in finer points, there are interpretations you, you have to kind of learn and understand uh, as, as the way that the map relates to what you're playing. Um, <clears throat> on top of the basic rules, you know, just the, the general rules, which uh, I am using, I guess I should point out, I, I am using the uh, 1.5 rules that came uh, in the... Um, uh, on a Richmond 2 game that was just... Uh, released the reprint of Honor Richmond, <clears throat> which is a fabulous, great big package. Um, the 1.4 to 1.5 rules aren't that that different. It wouldn't really make a difference if I were using one versus the other here, but I just happen to have 1.5 out because I want to be reading the latest rules. So that is what I'm doing. Uh, then within the game specific booklet, and in Stonewall Jackson's Way 2, um, all the modules are in one book. Um, so at the beginning, there's the green labeled sections for all green alike. Um, and these add a couple additional basic rules uh, that come in, which are largely around things like uh, cavalry are permanently disorganized. They are uh, always disorganized. Your strength units can either be organized or, or disorganized. And they tend to fight worse when they're disorganized. So uh, cavalry is always disorganized. Um, there's a few bits about, you know, leaders being particular, um, a few thing about, you know, fairies, uh, are actually Fords. <laughs> so Snickers fairy and, uh, Barry's fairy are Fords if destroyed. Um, but they're actually, I guess they are fairies until they're destroyed. So something to watch out for. Um, the command radius for leaders is two hexes, not three which is the ordinary. So ordinarily you would be able to, uh, if you had a leader, like down here we have Johnston, being able to interact with units that are one, two, three hexes away, 
well, because this is very early and all the forces are all, you know, all green alike, as Lincoln put it, um, it's actually down to two. So you can go out to two hexes, uh, which means units, uh, you know, core uh, components of a core or components of a division, depending on the size of the, the units we're talking about, um, are going to have to stay closer together than they ordinarily would if I want them to be in the leader's range. Uh, that doesn't mean I can't send somebody out further afield, but if I want to stay organized with leader activations, I need to keep them closer together. Um, something there. Uh, other thing is there's also a limit on how many units can be activated by a leader on both sides. So more command constraints, you could call it. Um, so there's a normal <laughs> approach to how many units you can, you can activate with a leader activation. Um, here it, it's further constrained. And then as it relates to combat, ordinarily what you can do um, is when you activate with a leader and you are basically activating the units within the command range of that leader, they could all do movement and combat and all that goodness. And in this game, combat is a function of movement. You give up some movement points to launch a certain kind of attack. Well, in this game, the if you're going to do a leader activation, the only unit that can attack is the first one that you move in that activation. So if the leader has three distinct units uh, in its command radius, you know, it has three, it can activate, let's say, three in this case. Well, only that first one that begins moving is going to be able to attack. The rest can only maneuver, and that also means that the first, you know, the first one uh, that attacks, you know, you, you're not allowed to set up a much better attack uh, with the two other units because they're going to move after your attacking unit, right? So I guess that to describe that better, like if you didn't have to do that, maybe you would move, you know, two units and then attack with a third, you know, create some surrounding Zox situation and then bring the third unit on to attack this, this victory hex. Well, instead, it's the first can come forward and attack, and then the other ones can come up behind and get into a better position afterwards. So, again, just constraints on your operational capability. Um, because I'm starting chronologically this way, it, it, I, I maybe I'll feel later when I'm playing other campaigns in the series that, oh gosh, yes, the armies are getting better. <laughs> they're, they're getting better at this whole fighting thing um, than they were in All Green Alike in, in 61, where... Uh, you know, we're, we're all getting used to this uh, situation. So <clears throat> um, now, besides even all of that, uh, there are additional advanced game rules that aren't going to affect this scenario. So um, I will hit those uh, when I go to do the Virginia campaign. But at least for this uh, four turn beginner scenario, um, those are m largely the big rules that matter. Now, there are other uh, fiddling that has to do with bridges, ferries, destroying ferries and, and bridges. Um, and to be honest, I, I don't really know what to think of some of those rules because when I actually read them in the rule book, it, it, it does go to a, a decent effort to try to talk about like, oh, okay, well, you can destroy a bridge. You can destroy these things. You can damage these things. You have to be so strong to do it. And there, there's these kind of different permutations to doing it. And I know that those types of things were done in these campaigns. So I know that like that, that is a factor. Um, but knowing, you know, what I don't have a good sense of because I'm new to the system is like, when would you want to do that? Like when, when is the time that you want to try to do that? I don't see the union probably doing much of that because they want to get across rivers as the, the strategic attacker, um, or, you know, the strategic offensive, and they want to keep those bridges and, and such open because they're moving units, you know, through the territory. Then I would see maybe, you know, the, the, the rebels being the ones who are more willing to destroy infrastructure uh, to try to slow down uh, the United States. So, you know, I, I, I've got a... Um, I have got to think through the implications of that. Um, when does it make sense to do it? Because you do actually have to make a concerted effort to do it. You have to like get a unit in place. They have to be at a certain fatigue level. And then you lean into actually doing that thing, destroying or damaging the bridge. <clears throat> and, and I get the feeling like in many of these scenarios, I would just be, I would rather be having those units moving forward and, and 
actually fighting and being of use than than slowing down uh, and doing all those things. But it's got to matter. It's got to be important somewhere, and I need to keep that in mind. Other thing for this scenario, uh, the Harper's Ferry uh, bridge here is destroyed. Or like it's just not there, period. And so there's a marker to denote that. Um, so that's one, you know, the, the fact that we can't get down there and easily cross that part of the river, you know, is something we need to keep in mind. Generally, this scenario is really banded between the Blue Ridge Mountains and the South Mountain Range and the North Mountain Range. So everything's kind of in this part of the valley and, and where the focus is going to be. So I'm not, not too terribly worried about that. Um, other thing just to call out before we get fully underway, the, the activation system in this game is pretty straightforward. Every time, you know, like you're done moving a unit, uh, whoever's moving a unit, you uh, do roll um, initiative. And so then, <clears throat> the, depending on that, uh, who won the initiative roll, that player will then get to select either, you know, they can do a leader activation or they can select one unit to activate. Um, and cavalry uh, won't have leaders in this module. And so if you're going to move cavalry, that has to be done as an individual unit activation. When you do that, you roll some dice to determine how many movement points that unit gets. Cavalry get two dice. Uh, infantry get, you know, infantry and artillery get one. And that will determine how many movement points they get to go and do the stuff that they need to do. You can have cases where one player is going to get to go over and over and over again if they keep winning initiative. But the, the con to that is that every time you, you move a unit, you activate a unit, you do anything, they begin to accrue fatigue markers, which are effectively like energy spent. Uh, and if you spend up a unit to, to where they have three or more fatigue, at the end of the turn, they become exhausted. Um, and then exhausted basically means that it's easier for them to enter a, an extended movement state and suffer penalties. So when you uh, force a unit to move around a lot, they become, uh, you know, they, they could become exhausted. They also, uh, if they reach a certain fatigue level, it means they took an extended march, which will cause units to become disorganized. So they're not going to be as good at fighting. It may even mean manpower loss, which means a unit actually gets weaker. <clears throat> the other thing that you can do is you can do a force march to increase your movement points by another die roll, but that almost uh, assuredly is going to mean that units become disorganized and you lose uh, manpower. So while there's, I think it's a bit confusing if the system has both an extended march and a force march, they're distinct and different, and you can kind of do both, and they have like kind of the same effect. I feel like that's a little confusing, but I, I mean, I get it, but I, I could see where that could trip people up. Um, the, the, the main takeaway is the more you push your guys, right? I mean, like this, the, the nice thing is these rules do attach itself to like a logical, rational simulation like point that the more you push your units in a given time frame, the more you, you run them ragged to get somewhere or to keep pushing wherever they're going to go, the more disorganized uh, they become, the more tired they become, and you start to lose guys from attrition, and, and maybe that also reflects desertion, though I don't know, you know the, the numbers and metrics on desert, uh, desertion in this particular campaign of All Green Alike during this time period. So... That's, that's the main thing. You have bodies of men. You can move them forward. They will fight. They will operate. And then depending on how much you ask them to do, their, their overall efficiency is going to degrade over time, which um, that's in pretty good alignment with other kinds of games that I've played, even PC games that um, illustrate the same kind of mentality uh, in, in terms of what's being portrayed. So all of that is, is actually quite good. Um, I, I appreciate that. That makes total sense to me. And in some early fiddling with a different game in the system, um, I did kind of experience that. So technically, I have played the system off camera a little bit. I did take a picture. I put that up on the YouTube feed. Um, but that was, you know, again, another beginner scenario, a different beginner scenario that was later in the war, um, me just kind of getting familiar with the way things operate. So this should be a bit, uh, a bit different. Um, I should I should do better, <laughs> generally speaking. Um, okay, so across the Potomac, what what's the deal here? Well, 
the, the, the main narrative point here is that Patterson on the United States uh, side is going to be coming across the Potomac. That's why the scenario is called Across the Potomac. Um, you have Johnston and also this guy named Jackson uh, here that would contest that crossing. Um, there's a guy named Stewart up here as well. So some names you may have heard of before. Uh, so the rebels are going to try to uh, either delay or disrupt the uh, the U.S. advance. Um, and the way that the victory conditions are set are that uh, there's different tiers of towns that you would take control of um, that would affect, uh, you know, would affect victory point calculations. So I've used different colored bingo chits actually to represent the different tiers. So the first tier uh, are these ones here in red where if, if at least one of those is controlled by the United States, um, then, then that's worth two victory points to the U.S. If they can make it to at least one of these blue uh, hexes and control it while retaining control of the red, uh, you know, a red hex behind them, then uh, that would be worth six victory points. And then if they can make it down here to the green while well, again retaining some control behind them, uh, that's going to be worth nine victory points. Um, so you, you can kind of get a, a really nice buildup of victory points if the United States uh, Army is able to uh, advance down this far, right? That's, that's the idea. Other victory points are going to be uh, coming in based on manpower losses. So uh, every time we have a manpower loss due to combat uh, retreat or cavalry retreat, so the, the, you know you don't lose or get victory points for manpower losses from extended march or forced march, but if it's from combat and retreat, um, then that that's going to give victory points. So what could happen is uh, if Patterson and and the other uh, U.S. Army forces come across the Potomac, they may take these locations. But they've totally denuded their their manpower such that the uh, the rebels have a manpower advantage. You know the the United States could actually still lose the scenario because of that. So um, we can't we we need to not be outfought and we need to advance into uh, you know these areas across the Potomac and, uh, as the United States and then again as the rebels we we want to disrupt that we want to stop that and. Uh, delay that as as much as we can. There's four turns, which are four days functionally. So um, if I want to keep units from becoming exhausted, they're going to get to move two times, going up to a fatigue level two, and that's without uh, fighting, and fighting will almost always add fatigue to units. Um, so, so each unit on the board will only move a couple of times probably each day. Um, so there's going to be a lot of of challenge and just where can we get to and how and i'm going to be dreadfully fearing uh, bad movement die rolls as the u.s because they really need it and i'm a little worried you know wow it's a it's a factor of the system that uh you know movement is kind of this unknown factor that you can't account for um well, what happens if you are rolling ones all the time for movement like and that can happen right you know, you know, don't act like it can't happen. It can definitely happen. So you, you need to think through, like, what can I achieve if I'm only rolling low uh, movement points? The, the other tricky thing with that, and this is the pro and con of the activation system, which is, is fair, if you use a leader to activate, all the units activated are going to use the same die roll for movement. So it could be you use a leader activation, you roll a one, and all your guys are going to move just a little bit. Or it could be they all move a lot. The The... You know, con to that being like you've just added fatigue to a lot of your forces and maybe didn't get to do a whole lot where the, the adverse is trying to activate them individually. And then you at least have multiple chances for somebody to get enough movement points to move a great distance or a much farther distance and, and have an impact. Um, but because you're doing that individually, you don't really know if you're going to be able to get multiple activations in a row to do the thing that you want. So I do appreciate that um and i'm just i fear the back-to-back -back ones for the uh, the union for the united states uh, that's, that's something i'm worried about um anyway 
So uh, the very first initiative, which is where we're going to start things, is uh, the United States. Um, they have initiative on turn one, and then after the first activation, they're going to uh, do uh, initiative normally. We're going to do initiative normally. I am using force markers, so um, there are forces over here uh, off map to keep the stacking from getting ridiculous at the beginning of this campaign. I will probably take those units off the force um, uh, the force display um, once they spread out more. But, but basically, like, Patterson's folks are all right up in here stacked. So I have the leaders uh, in this scenario stacked up along with forces and a unit that can't move until turn three. And so I've put a not released marker on top of him. There's also some additional forces in the back at Hagerstown. And then, um, likewise, the majority of the rebel forces um, are actually down in Winchester with Johnston. He has uh, a number of uh, a number of brigades, and and several of them can only move so far on the first turn. There's a restriction um, that uh, Barrow, B, and LZ uh, may only move to fatigue level one on turn one, which functionally means they can move once on turn one. So the, the United States has an opportunity before Johnston can really get moving to try to make a big difference. So we'll, we'll see what we can do with that. Um, I do need to think about what I want to do as the activation. Um, and this was a pretty long introduction. So what I'm going to do is call this video here and then um, we'll do in the next video, we'll actually start playing. So this is I, I don't know how you want to look at it, guys. This is a very long introduction, 26-minute introduction, 27-minute introduction. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of context I had to give to, to the system. Not quite a tutorial, but some level setting on, on how all of this is supposed to work, especially if you've never seen the system in action before. Um, providing that context to me was important. Uh, in the next video, we'll probably be able to play through the whole of the scenario in the next video. Um, or at least show the aftermath uh, pretty pretty quickly. So uh, we'll see you in the next one, guys. <clears throat> uh, sorry for, for a bit of a, a lengthy one here for just an intro, but uh, this is this is a game system I've been waiting a long time to dive right deep into, and um, I'm, I'm finally getting to do it in earnest, and uh, it'll be a fun journey. So we'll, uh, we'll see you then. Take care. Keep gaming.